Hello and welcome to our third lecture for the story of Christianity. Last time we looked at the development of the Christological doctrines through the various councils in the early church. Today we're going to back up a little bit and deal with some other issues that transition us from the early church into the Middle Ages. We'll be looking at first Augustine of Hippo, the most significant theologian of this period, if not church history as a whole. We'll look at his life and some of his major controversies that contributed to the nature of medieval and contemporary Christianity. We'll also look at the fall of the Western Roman Empire and think about its implications for the nature of the church, both in the West and a little bit in the East. We'll also look at the rise of monasticism and how this institution functioned within the church and the contributions and some critiques of this movement that would define most of Western and Eastern Christianity for over a thousand years. We'll also look at the impact of the rise of Islam on the Western church and how this shifted the both economic, political, and religious elements of the ancient world into the configuration of the present day. And finally, we'll look at the transition into the early medieval period with the rise of what we call Christendom, which can be exemplified by the reign of Charlemagne and his relationship to the papacy, or the Pope, in Rome. So let's begin with St. Augustine. So Augustine is by far the most significant theologian of the ancient period. His thought would influence um, nearly all major theologians from then on. He was originally from North Africa, and his theology would in some ways set the tone and be the culmination of the ancient fathers of the West. So we're going to look at his life, we're going to look at the major controversies that he was involved in and how he contributed to the theology of the church in those, and then we'll look at the reception briefly of his thought beyond his lifetime. So to begin with, Augustine was born in North Africa to a Christian mother and a pagan father. Monica was very diligent in trying to raise her son in the faith, although he often, um, especially in his early years until his mid-30s, was very reluctant to do this. Uh, Augustine's father was a pagan and did not see Monica's attempts to raise him in the Christian faith at, with, much, um, with much celebration. He didn't hinder it, but he also did not help, encouraging Augustine to live very much a life of ancient paganism. Augustine's major works, which we'll touch on a few today, are the Confessions, an autobiographical text in which he sets forth his conversion and in, in some ways gives us a model for um, understanding the soul's relationship to God. He has a very important work on the Trinity, which will set the tone for all of Western thought afterwards, and the City of God, in which he contributes to the understanding of political theology within the West till the present day. So, let's begin by looking at his life through his work, The Confessions. Augustine's Confessions often offer a biographical sketch of his own life in the first nine books of the work. He tells us of his early childhood and his uh, attempts by his mother to raise him in the Christian faith. Although she is not successful, he instead pursues a life of academics. He goes and he trains in rhetoric, which was one of the major subjects and ways to advance yourself uh, for a young man in this day. He moves to Carthage, the largest city in his area, and he is very skilled in teaching and rhetoric, and yet he pursues a very wayward life. In this work, he reflects upon some of his early childhood sins, and one of the most poignant scenes is him with several friends going into a neighbor's field and stealing pears. Now, you might think this is a rather odd um, youthful hijink, and why would Augustine focus on the such, but it, later in his life, after he's become converted, he sees this, this act as exemplifying the nature of human sinfulness. We see also we're at a fruit and a tree, so he's echoing the Garden of Eden there, but as he reflects on, why did I steal this? Why did I want these pears? And he thought, it wasn't because I was hungry, I could always get more food, but rather it was just for the thrill of doing something wrong. It was, in fact, for sin itself that I did this act. And this is how Augustine reflects on the nature of sin, that it is so deep within us that we seek out the bad and that which is evil, that which is wrong, for its own sake. And he reflects on this, this is the, the curve of our own heart. We desire wrong things, our orders are desired, and they move us away from God. After his time in North Africa, he will move to, um, to Italy, 
And all, along this period, he's also coming into contact with what is called Manichaeanism, which was a religious system that was very dualistic, seeing two primary principles in the world, a principle of light and a principle of darkness. And it, they're equally matched, and one's goal is to side with the light in face of this almost interminable movement of darkness. Augustine stays with the Manichaeans for many years, but ultimately becomes... Um, he becomes disillusioned with them, seeing that they don't really have a problem to the nature of evil. He then gravitates towards Neoplatonic philosophy, um, which we talked about a little bit last time, and sees that they get close, but they, are, they still leave him um, seeking after more. It's in Milan where he goes and he uh, sits under the preaching of Ambrose, one of the other great fathers of the Western Church. Augustine doesn't go because he's seeking out Christ. He goes because he hears that Ambrose is a fine rhetorician. And as a professor of this discipline, he wants to see what the fuss is all about. But it's through Ambrose that Augustine's faith will come about. Through hearing his preaching, being instructed by Ambrose, he is able to come and convert to Christianity, to the delight of his mother, who is actually in Milan at the time. So Augustine uses this scene of his own conversion as a model for the Christian soul, that all of us are lost and we need to be found by God's grace. This is exemplified in the scene of his conversion. An uh, image of it is above me. In this, Augustine begins to study the letters of Paul at Ambrose's urging, and he and a friend are sitting in a garden, and Augustine hears a cry of children saying, Telo lege, telo lege which seems to be part of some child's game. It means take up and read. So Augustine takes up the letter of Paul to the Romans, and he reads and is confronted with his sin, and moves and calls out to Christ for his grace and forgiveness. And it's in this understanding that Augustine grounds all of the Christian life, this disordered heart that seeks us to move away from God, to seek after what is evil, to reject what is good in the world. And yet we're always going to be dissatisfied. There's something about us that calls out to know God. And that's why one of the main themes of his entire work is this famous line. Uh, the entire work is written as a prayer to God of thanks and confession of Augustine's faith. And this is what Augustine says. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. This is kind of the heartbeat of all of Augustine's theology. It is only God who can bring us into peace. It is only God who can bring us out of the restlessness of sin and the den denigration of our lives. After Augustine's conversion, as his heart finds rest in the true source of life, he moves back to um, North Africa and intends to found a monastic community and live a life of study and prayer. However, he is forced into the priesthood. People see his skills and say, no, you need to be a priest, and eventually becomes the Bishop of Hippo. It's in this capacity as the Bishop of Hippo that he begins his serious theological writings and engages with controversies that will shape all of the Western Church. So we're going to look at two of these controversies, first with the Donatists, which is very important for understanding the nature of the church, and then with Pelagius, which is one of the first controversies over the nature of salvation. So let's turn to who are the Donatists. We've actually run into them in some ways before. We talked about how after especially the Diocletian persecution, where many Christians did apostatize and give up um, even the scriptures of the church to the pagan authorities. Um, these people were called tradators, those who handed over, and many bishops and priests were also in this mix. In North Africa, Donatus um, said that this could not; these people could not come back into the church. They had apostatized, they were done, there was no way for them to return. And he actually formed a schism within the church of those who regarded these traitors um, coming back into the church as a pollution of the church, compromising its holiness. For the Donatists, they were rigorous, and we had you have to live a very pure moral life to remain in the church. Anything else will have you cut off from the community. The church itself is a church of saints. Sinners have no place in it, according to the Donatists. And the sacraments, including baptism, the Lord's Supper, and uh, everything else that the priest does, must be administered by blameless and holy people. According to the Donatists, if this is not the case, then they are invalid. 
So they look at those bishops and priests who had handed over Christian books as invalid in themselves, and therefore anyone who had been ordained by them or any sacrament issued by them, including baptism and the Lord's Supper, and um, marriage might have been included, it's unclear at this time, were invalid due to the unholiness and um, unfaithfulness of these people. Therefore, all of the line of priests and bishops coming out of those who handed over the scriptures needed to be reconsecrated in the Donatist church. This has a lot of implications. What does make the preaching, the sacraments, and the church itself valid? What are we to do with the sinfulness of the church? Does it render it completely without hope? How are we to wrestle with these ideas? And so Augustine seeks to dig into this, and he has many responses that will become standard for the church throughout the West. So first off, Gust, Augustine thinks about the nature of the church's holiness. Why can we say that the church is a holy people? Is it because of the acts of those within it? Is it only a communion of saints? Or is there something more going on? For Augustine, the holiness of the church is not dependent upon its members, but upon Jesus Christ, her head. The holiness that the church has is the gift of God, and it will only be perfectly realized in the eschaton, in the last days. So the church's holiness, our status as those set apart, is not an act internal to us, but it is something that has been gifted to the church by our Lord and Savior. Therefore, the church itself, as we see it in the world, will be heterogeneous. It will be made up of different parts. There will be both believers and unbelievers in the church. This distinction will be developed later in uh, Reformed theology for the invisible and visible. The visible church, that's which we see, will be made up of both sinners and saints. And we cannot rip them out because we cannot really know. Augustine appeals here to the parable of Jesus of the wheat and the tares, in which both the weeds and the wheat grow up together in the kingdom of God, and they will not be finally separated into the end. And therefore, he calls the Dantists to come back to the church, seeing that it is they, they can't force a purity on the church from without. This is an act of God and cannot be taken on the human person. This does not mean Augustine doesn't hold to discipline um, or discipleship of the church, but realizing that the ultimate salvation of those in the church and their ultimate holiness cannot be determined by normal sight. And there he moves into the validity of priestly and Episcopal acts, such as ordination, baptism, and the Lord's Supper, locating their efficacy, what makes them valid, not in, the per, not in the officiant, but in the grace of Christ that is exhibited therein. So it is not the moral worth of the office holder or the pastor or the priest that gives validity to the sacraments, but it is God's act and God's promises that does so. This isn't very important even for today. What do we do with um, pastors or elders who have fallen? who have fallen into deep sin, and maybe even left the faith. Does that mean that their preaching was um, innately false? What does that mean for the marriages that they um, conducted? What does that mean for the baptisms that they underwent? Is the faithfulness of the minister um, what we should can be concerned about with the validity of these things? Augustine would say, no, even imperfect men can be used by God to offer his grace and his gospel. And God can use even a crooked crooked stick to draw a straight line, if you will. So Augustine here is putting the emphasis on God's activity in the church. The church is God's city, God's kingdom, and not the product of human effort. And so when we walk through this pilgrim life, it's our holiness needs to be focused on what Christ is doing, what the promises of Scripture are doing. And as we see and expect that there will be sin within our midst, um, we can understand that this is something that God will finally rectify in the end, and it doesn't invalidate what we're doing. So the Donatist controversy will be very significant for the later church, seeing that the church is in the world and will still have sin and cannot be fu fully purified by human effort, but must wait on God. Similar themes come up in his other major controversy against Pelagius. This is a controversy primarily about the nature of salvation. How is it that one is saved, and what is required of the individual for them to be saved? This controversy is kicked off by a monk named Pelagius, who comes from the Celtic lands, uh, probably Britain or uh, maybe northern France, it's hard to say exactly. He lived a very uh, austere life, uh, a very harsh discipline. He moves to Rome in 380 and begins to preach there. 
He'll later move throughout the empire, moving to Carthage in 410 and then Jerusalem. And we'll talk about why that is in a moment. As Pelagius enters into Rome, he sees the moral laxity of society and of Christians there. He sees uh, wealthy Christians ignoring the poor. He sees um, people uh, living in sexual immorality, prominent Christian men having mistresses, uh, the priests living in an undisciplined manner. And he, he attributes this to the t teaching of divine grace, that if one is to rely purely on God's grace and faith for salvation, this will lead to moral laxity, moral license. And so he taught rather a rigorous morality and aesthetic life is the way to approach God. It is only through a very um, striving after moral purity and self-control in all areas of life that salvation can ultimately be attained. This teaching would be challenged by the most prominent theologians of the day, including Augustine, uh, when he goes to, when Pelagius goes to Carthage after the fall of Rome in 410, and then later after he moves to Jerusalem by Jerome, the great translator of the Bible into Latin. So let's look a little bit deeper about the nature of Pelagius's theology. So it begins when human beings are born. What is our state? According to Pelagius, all human beings are born neutral able to do either good or evil. They have complete free will, and sin does not lead them in, inexorably to sin. Okay, So the sin, there, there is no corruption of our nature. We Our natures are still pure. We are all, in some ways, like Adam and Eve were in the garden. Therefore, Pelagius rejects the doctrine of original sin, that because of the sins of Adam and Eve, our hearts, our minds, and our souls have been warped away from God, and we continually seek after that which is evil. Humans do evil, be, uh, according to Pelagius, because of bad examples of others who they see doing evil. This begins with Adam and Eve. The result of the fall is not so much that we inherit a corrupt nature, but we inherit a bad example. And so we're all born, we see others doing evil, and we do evil ourselves. Therefore, through an exercise of moral purity, of separation from the world, um, human beings can seek after good, according to Pelagius. Because of humanity's utterly free will, not tainted by sin in any way, they can choose God and they can live a moral life because of it. They can, in some ways, earn salvation through moral striving and aesthetic disciplines. So Pelagius, you can see this coming out of his monastic tradition, that in this moral striving, one finds the height of Christian spirituality and purity. And he's attacking here this question of, um, one of the main questions for him is the justice of God. If we're born into sin, says Pelagius, and we can do nothing but sin, God is unjust to judge us. And therefore, all human beings must be capable of doing good with the proper amount of effort and moral striving, except we do not. And therefore, God is just to condemn us all because we fail to live up to his offered path of salvation, which is moral excellence and striving. So you can see how this would drastically shape an understanding of salvation. What is the purpose of Christ in such a system? For Augustine, or sorry, for Pelagius, this is, Christ is our better example. As Adam and Eve were our evil example, pursuing their own pride and sin, Christ becomes the, the highest example of the moral good. And so salvation comes by following him. Augustine will take issue with this because this is not, um, according to scripture, the point of Christ's work for us and the incarnation. So let's look at Augustine's response to Pelagius' teaching. Augustus didn't write a single work against Pelagius, but in fact wrote 15 different works dealing with different parts of Pelagius' theology. And Augustine's goal is to preserve the graciousness of salvation. Think back to what we talked about in his conversion. Augustine experienced conversion not by moral striving, but desperately calling out to God. He sensed that God had pulled him out of his darkness. Remember uh, the pear tree, that the human soul is gravitated towards evil and we desire what is wrong and we relish in our own pride and immaturity and there is nothing good in us. We cannot move and choose God. So Augustine sees the foundation here as the graciousness of God towards human beings. Therefore, he says, rather than Pelagius arguing that humanity is born neutral, Humanity is born in sin because of the fall of Adam and Eve. This is original sin. Our hearts, our minds, and our souls are corrupted and turned away from God. We pursue what is evil. We pursue our own pride. Augustine talks about sin as being incurvatus in se, curved in 
on ourselves. That devotion we are to give to God and that love we're supposed to give to our neighbor, we turn inward and it crushes our soul and we pursue pride, envy, and hatred. Therefore, this is our state. We are all in original sin. And we still sin actually as well. So we're born in sin and then we contribute to sin by our own um, sins following this. After the fall, we will only will against God and be bent towards sin. So Augustine works out a schema of the various stages of human existence from the fall to the eschaton. Adam and Eve were able not to sin. They had some measure of free will and could have chosen not to sin. After the fall, we are not able not to sin. Our wills, our minds, our hearts, our desires are corrupt and will lead us continually into sin. After the redemption of Christ, who saves us, who pays the penalty for our sin, we are now able not to sin because of the work of the Holy Spirit and the regeneration um, and the grace of God. In the end of time, we will not be able to sin because Christ will pur fully purify us, redeem our broken and corrupt nature to serve him only. Because of this understanding and the complete inability of humanity to pursue God, which uh, Augustine is taking from Paul's writings, especially in Ephesians and Romans, that we are dead in our sin. A dead man does not get up and walk, nor lift a, a finger to raise himself from the dead. He is incapable. He is immobile. And the discussion in Romans 5, that in Adam all have sinned, and we need Christ to become our new head, our new leader, our new Lord. And so for Augustine, Salvation comes only by God's grace, his unmerited favor and gift that Christ has secured for us by his death on the cross, by his mercy, the justice of God that would condemn us for our sins, that even though there is the original sin, we do willingly and are culpable for. By this act of grace, God restores a will for the good and grants faith. So it is God who takes the first, last, and every initiative in bringing about salvation. And our response out of gratitude and living a pure and noble life does not come to earn salvation or to move towards salvation, as Pelagius says, but flows out of one who is saved and the knowledge of God. The heart that was restless has now found rest in its creator and can pursue the good because grace has now come to change us, to remake us, to build us into new creations. Augustine also takes this to an understanding, if salvation is purely by God's grace, meaning that it is by God's initiative only and humans contribute nothing to the effort, therefore God must predestine those who will be saved. So uh, Augustine develops the first kind of thorough theology of predestination, that it is by God's election, his choice that one is saved and not by any uh, effort in the human being. God does not choose because of foreseen faith, foreseen merit, or anything in the individual, because that would still help, that would allow people to contribute to their salvation. But it's purely by God's elective will that humanity comes to be brought um, to God. But this does not leave humanity off the hook for their sins. We are still very much responsible for all of our sins because it is our will doing it. And we are the ones who have sinned and God is just to condemn us. But in his mercy, he forgives us. He leads us to Christ through his activity uh, of the spirit and we can have um, salvation from him. So you can see these are very different understandings of salvation. Pelagius focusing almost purely on the human effort and Augustine focusing purely on God's grace and activity to redeem the human being into the fullness of life. So Pelagius' teaching would ultimately be condemned first at a local council in Carthage that Augustine oversaw, rejecting this as going against scripture. And then as uh, Pelagius moves to the east, he is also condemned at the Council of Ephesus in 431. However, this will not be the end of this discussion, but these debates over the nature of grace, the nature of predestination, the nature of free will, will resound throughout cr Christian history. And you'll have controversies over these issues um, roughly about every 200 years in various settings. Uh, one of the most significant comes in about a century after a uh, yeah, a century after Augustine's death at the Council of Orange, uh, which was held in 529. So there was continued disagreement over these issues, especially by a man named John Cashin, who was one of the first uh, major figures to bring monasticism into Gaul. And so you can see how this might be difficult for monks who are living this very austere moral life and striving after moral excellence. Does this mean that this is all in vain? What is the point of all this? Are we just giving a license for people to sin and live morally lax lives? 
And so at this council, these discussions are brought back up, and it's a, a very significant event in church history. So they begin by rejecting a position that is normally called semi-Pelagianism. So um, Pelagius' doctrine were too extreme for most people. Uh, he had very little room for divine grace, as far as we could say, and there was almost all human effort. Semi-Pelagianism gives a place to the grace of God. However, free will is still the de deciding factor in one's coming to faith. So semi-Pelagianism, human's free will initiates faith, but grace is what brings it to fulfillment. So you come to God by your own free will, and it is by um, grace that you continue in God with your cooperation. So we initiate salvation in the semi-Pelagian understanding. The council rejects semi-Pelagianism and affirms what is often called semi-Augustinianism. Called semi because it doesn't follow Augustine in all of his teachings and implications on this doctrine. It is by pervenient grace that one may choose God. So there is a grace that God gives to all people, reforming their will enough so that they can choose the good. And it is by grace that one grows in faith. So in semi-Augustinianism, Grace does precede faith. There is still an act of a will. It is still the deciding factor of a human being of whether or not they will choose God. And it is grace that completes this action. So it is grace from beginning to end, but there is the turning point in the activity is still the free will of human beings. This position denies two of the very important positions of Augustine. It denies his very firm and clear doctrine of predestination, which is not based on anything in the individual, and it denies the irresistibility of grace. So, in Augustine's theology, God's act of grace to give faith will result in salvation. There is no turning away from the grace of God. If God acts and through his activity chooses an individual, they will turn to him. There, there is no doubt in this for Augustine. Grace is effective. It will turn us to God. It is not just giving us the opportunity, but is actually affecting our salvation. And uh, Augustine would work this out in his understanding of predestination in various places. So the Council of Orange really sets the tone for the official Catholic theology throughout the Middle Ages and even today. The official position is something like semi-Augustinianism, although the temptation towards a semi-Pelagianism, uh, this emphasis on human free will initiating salvation, will crop up again and again, although there will also be those who follow a more fully Augustinian position. Keep these issues in mind because they'll be very important as we look at the Reformation and the question of how are human beings saved before God, what is needed. All right, so I hope we've done a good job of introducing Augustine of Hippo and some of his major contributions to the church. His ideas about the holiness of the church and the nature of its institutions would be extremely influential uh, from then on. His, in, his ideas about the nature of salvation would really influence some of the most significant figures in the church, such as uh, Anselm and St. Thomas Aquinas and Calvin and Luther would very much uh, draw from Augustine's well. And there's much more we could talk about here. Um, his doctrine of the Trinity was extremely influential and is still today. His understanding of the relationship of the church to political society and the city of God um, is extremely influential. And his emphasis on desire and love is an extremely important aspect of his thought. That he is calling us to understand and to pursue God with all of our heart. Um, that is not just about the mind, but it, faith comes when God redeems and restores our heart to its proper functioning. Okay. But Augustine lived at what we would call a liminal time. He's in some ways standing on the threshold of a new era. We can see this, that at his death in 430, he's actually living in Hippo when it is besieged by an invading army of the Vandals. The world that Augustine grew up in, the world that was steeped in ancient Roman and Greek thought and under the secure guise of the empire that had now supported Christianity, would be coming to an end. And this brings us to our next main point, the fall of the Western Roman Empire. This will drastically change the situation of Christianity in the West especially, and bring tensions that will be worked out over the next several hundred years. So to understand this, let's roll back a little bit to the time of Constantine. So even at the time of Constantine and before, um, the Emperor Diocletian had divided the empire in two, the west into the east, each of which had um, a head emperor and a subsequent lower emperor. Now, this setting was trying to um, divide up the administrative tasks of the empire to make it more efficient, to um, focus local defense on local areas. 
and to make sure taxes were gathered properly and whatnot. However, uh, this was a rather unstable situation. Uh, too many men too close to the throne led to continual civil war, as we saw with uh, Constantine himself, who ultimately defeated all the other uh, emperors and co-emperors of the uh, of the empire itself and became the sole emperor. However, he would keep these kind of um, he would keep these divisions in the church between the west and the east, and they begin to begin to develop very different cultures and very different structures of society. Partially, this is a linguistic issue, with the eastern half of the empire speaking Greek and the western half speaking Latin. As the years go by, the empire becomes more and more unstable, especially as there are pressures externally from Germanic peoples and Gothic peoples, who begin to press in on the empire. This is set off by the rise of the Huns in the east, who push all the other tribes before them, and they end up invading the Roman Empire, partially um, to seek new land to get away from the Huns. And eventually, sometimes, the Roman Emperor will ally with these tribes, allow them to settle, but that uh, almost never works. They're generally poorly treated, and they then rebel against the Empire, sacking cities and whatnot. And so, these coming of what we generally call the Germanic, or in older discussions, the barbarian invasions, will sink the entire Western Roman Empire. If we look at the map here, we see several waves of different peoples coming in to the empire. And the army at this point of Rome is rather ill-equipped. Uh, there's been changes in the structure of garrisoning armies far away from the frontier and supposed to go out to meet incursions, uh, but this is slow. The, the men develop uh, laxity in their duties, and they are generally quickly defeated by these more, um, more virile tribes uh, who are bred for war. Um, in many ways. This is the center of their society. Some of the most significant events in this come in 410, when the Visigoths sack Rome. It is this event that leads Pelagius to leave Rome and move to Carthage. It is also this event that inspires Augustine to write his work, The City of God. Because if you recall, uh, pagans would also often blame Christian for the failings of the empire. And the empire has uh, allowed Christianity now for uh, not quite a century, and the city, the holy, the eternal city for the, the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire has now been sacked by these barbarian invaders. And the educated pagan people of Rome blame Christianity and blame the failing of the empire on the weakness of Christianity and its rejection of the ancient uh, ancestral gods of Rome. Augustine City of God will attack this idea arguing that it was no, the society was no more better off with the ancient gods, and that, in fact, Christianity, which transcends all empires, um, is the truth, and is the only way for the, uh, the empire to actually maintain itself. Uh, Augustine is very clear, though, that the city of God will outlast all cities of man. So Augustine is very clearly drawing this distinction in which the city of God, the kingdom of God, the church, in its pure form before God, will outlast all earthly rule. And whether or not Rome falls, um, the church will prevail. There's continued invasions, especially of North Africa. You can see the pink line of the Vandals taking over North Africa in the 430s. It is uh, these people who besiege Hippo in 430, where Augustine uh, passes away under siege by these peoples, and they eventually seize Carthage. If you notice the names of these people, the Goths, the Vandals, the Huns, um, they're renowned for brutality and their kind of penchant for destruction has actually come uh, down to our own day in our own language. So uh, this was a very tumultuous time. As many were killed, cities were razed, the economic and institutional structures of Western Europe were destroyed, and this was an epochal shift in the history of the world. The Roman Empire, which had reigned over the whole Mediterranean basin, for about 500 years, had now crumbled. It still maintained in the east and would do so until 1453, when Byzantium or Constantinople is finally sacked by the Seljuk Turks. But western half of the empire disappears, and it falls into disarray and confusion. And out of the rubble of the empire comes what we could call the barbarian kingdoms, or uh, the successor kingdoms would be another name for this. We see that the Angles and the Saxons have taken over Roman Britain, uh, which the empire had actually abandoned years before, 
Uh, it was too far flung. There was not enough uh, worth in keeping the outpost there. And so the Angles and the Saxons have taken that over, forming the foundation of what will be um, medieval Britain. We see the Franks taking over what we understand as the north of present-day France. The Visigoths have Spain and southern France. The Ostrogoths take over Italy. And the Vandals form a kingdom in North Africa. And so what was once a unified political economic sphere in Western Europe has now been carved up by these tribal peoples with very different understandings about how societies ought to be run, different laws, different languages, and different religion. And this will cause many issues for the church because the only institution that really remains standing after this fall of the Western Roman Empire is the church and the monasteries. The Germanic tribes were not all, in fact, pagan, but many of them were Aryan Christians. And so we need to take a moment to think about how this happened. This came about by a missionary named Alpheus, uh, which means a little wolf in Gothic, who was a Greek whose parents had been captured by the Goths and enslaved. And so he grew up amongst them and learned their language. He eventually was freed and returned to the Greek world. In his adulthood, he went back to the Goths to preach the gospel. However, what he brings, notice his dates, he brings an Aryan form of Christianity in which Christ is not fully God, but merely the Son of God and a created being. So Alpheus spreads this to the people and the chief of the Gothic tribes convert. Uh, Alpheus is also renowned for being the first person to write a Bible in Gothic, and in, do, in so doing, he created the Gothic language itself. So think about this. The Church has just gone through centuries of discussion and debate over the nature of Christ. Arianism has been defeated completely and finally for about 200 years in the empire at this point. And yet these people from outside not only destroy your country, but bring back in a heresy that the church has been fighting against for centuries. This was a very precarious position, and the church was extremely worried. They were surrounded by... Um, heretics who were bringing back a faith that was against Nicaea and against Chalcedon. In God's providence, uh, things would change with the reign of a man named Clovis I, Clovis I, who was the Frankish king, and he united this fairly dis, um, disorganized Frankish tribes into a more thorough kingdom. And he is the founder of the Merovingian dynasty, which would be seen as the first dynasty of modern day France. Clovis himself was born a pagan and often resisted Christianity in all of its forms. However, he married a Burgundian princess named Clotilda, who was an Orthodox Christian, and she tirelessly worked for the conversion of her husband. Uh, she would seek to have her children baptized against Clovis's wishes, and she would continually bring priests and bishops in to speak with her husband and try to convince him to turn to Christ. Around 500 AD, Clovis does convert to Christianity and is later baptized, as you can see memorialized in a slightly later ivory carving above me. And because of the conversion of the king, the Franks themselves convert to Chalcedonian Orthodox Christianity. You have to remember at this time, conversion was not um, primarily an individual thing, but there was the conversion of peoples, conversion of families. So with the king going to Christianity and abandoning the ancient um, Frankish gods. This is an act that the whole kingdom contributes in. They receive baptism and they follow after Christ. So with this new kingdom of Orthodox Christianity, the Arians are checked for the moment. And eventually Clovis is able to defeat the Arian Visigoths in 507, creating a pressure for them to come in line with the Orthodox tradition. So we see here Clovis's kingdom, which he spreads out through most of his reign. Uh, basically covering most of what we would think as present-day France and parts of Germany. Um, and he would be in continual war. You have to understand this is a period of yearly wars between uh, rival factions. Um, and some would be fairly small scale, but others would go on for years and be quite brutal. The barbarian kingdom of Spain, the Visigothic kingdom, would also convert to Chalcedonian Catholic Christianity in 589. Partially, this is the pressure of Clovis, who is next to him, and uh, being able to have an alliance on religious lines between these people uh, would have been important. But the king of the Ostrogoths calls representatives of both Arianism and Orthodox Christianity before him, and allows them to debate the merits and points of this by the Bible. 
and he is ultimately convinced by the orthodox position and uh, outlaws Arianism within his land. So the Visigothic kingdom at the Third Council of Toledo will become an orthodox Christian nation. Uh, it's interesting, in the debate at the court, one of the things that sways the king is that the Arians have no miracles to their name, but the Orthodox Chalcedonians do. And so this is a big part. He finds the power of the religion in the Orthodox position. So let's discuss a couple consequences of this rise of the barbarian kingdoms and the fall of the Western Empire. 500 to 700 is a very tumultuous time. There are people who used to call this the Dark Ages. Uh, that is an in, inaccurate understanding, but you kind of get what they're saying. Not much was going on, many important figures, many important writings still exist in this period, but it was a downward progression from the height of the Roman Empire and resulted in much chaos and instability. We see a breakdown of the economy and institutions, which leads to everyone being much poorer. The church is really the only institution that remains standing. And in this, they provide care for the poor, but also in this period, amass much wealth as they um, take advantage is maybe not the right word, but profit from the economic downturn of buying land at cheap prices. And so the church is the main institution that brings continuity between the Roman period and the Germanic period of Western Europe. The church also must work to uh, be in missions in a very new way. So this act of converting the people, of trying to weed out those remaining pagan trends, which some scholars think lasted several hundred years, that the normal people were just Christian in name only with this paganism deep in their heart. And because of this, they were forced to contextualize the Christian met method to these new people and bring it into contact with Germanic ways of thinking. Um, one example of this is the monk Boniface, who goes to convert the Germanic tribes, the Saxons. And he does so by boldly going to a tree that is considered sacred to Thor and chopping it down. And in this, he is saying to this warlike barbarian people that our God is superior to yours. If the God of Thunder were real, he would stop me, this puny man, from chopping down his sacred oak. However, the God I serve... Jesus, the God who has created the world, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, is superior to Thor. And so these are very interesting ways of contextualizing and moving the gospel beyond the traditional bounds of the Roman Empire. Also, because of this break in politics, there's growing tensions between the Eastern and Western Church. The, the Western Church must make its peace with the barbarian nations, while the Eastern Church, still based in Constantinople, the capital of the remaining Roman Empire, sees this as something lesser, um, as giving in to these invading peoples. And so there'll be continual tension growing here between them. And communication is more difficult because there's no longer political unity throughout the empire. In light of this disordered and chaotic situation, there's another main um, there's another main movement that we need to talk about in order to understand the dynamics of Christianity from here on out. And that is the rise of monasticism. Monasticism, uh, monasticism's roots date back to much earlier than this period. And so we're going to take a step back to look at the monastic traditions and how they spread throughout Western Europe and their significance for the church in this era. Most significant in this early monastic movement was um, issues coming out of Egypt. So the earliest monastic communities date back to the 3rd century in Egypt. The most significant figure in this is a man named Anthony of the Desert. Anthony was a young man who was quite wealthy. He goes to a service in his late teens, and um, here's the message to the rich young ruler. Sell all that you own and follow me, says Christ. Anthony takes this very seriously and as a message to himself. He sells all of his possessions. He sends his sister, who he's responsible for, into a convent, which were prevalent at the time, and he goes into the desert alone. He leads what is called a hermetic life, a hermit. He spends all of his time in prayer and in ascetic discipline, seeking after the face of God. And this was not just Anthony's activity, but... Um, those who were known as the Desert Fathers would pursue this very, um, very rigorously. And they were known for their piety and even for their miracles. Anthony becomes so influential because Athanasius writes the life of Anthony. 
And this comes about after one of uh, Athanasius's many exiles. He goes into the de desert. Uh, he meets Anthony. And the life of St. Anthony telling his story, his practices, his sanctity. Um, he is said to have had the entire uh, Bible memorized. Being unable to read, he had memorized it by people reading it to him. Um, we see this ideal of giving everything up for Christ. And the life of St. Anthony would inspire many other reform movements and monks throughout the ages. But there weren't just hermits, those who lived off by themselves seeking a pure life before God, but there were also what are called Cenobitic uh, monasteries. The Cenobites are those who live together in a communal life, and this also originates probably in Egypt uh, from the work of a, ma a man named Pacomius. Uh, you can see on the map there that he was much more in the south of Egypt. In these communities, one would structure their whole life around devotion to God, prayer, and study. And this is a way to remove oneself from the corrupting influence of the world. Monasticism would predate the rise of Constantine in many places, but it is really after the legalization of Christianity in 313 that it begins to thrive in new ways. And you can see why this is. Um, during a time when Christianity is illegal, having all these monks living together uh, is going to be rather precarious and dangerous. So, one, with the legalization of Christianity, it becomes easier to have uh, the safety of monastic communities. However, there's also another factor that goes in here. We talked about earlier how be between the beginning of the 4th century and 300, Ro the Roman Empire was about 10% Christian. By 350, it has become 50% Christian. Because of the, uh, the connection between Christianity and the empire, many are seeing this as an advantageous thing. So you have, for the first time, the rise of nominal Christianity it, and the end of martyrdom, which was seen as the clearest witness of the church to the truth of the gospel message. So in some ways, the monastic move becomes an extension of martyrdom, not of giving up one's life, but giving up one's livelihood, one's life in the world, to purely pursue God in seclusion, in silence, and in peace. So in some ways, the monk became uh, one seeking bloodless martyrdom, to give up all to follow Christ. And this practice would be done by many, um, creating different monastic communities. Origin before the legalization of Christianity would found somewhat like a monastic community around the school in Alexandria. Basil of Caesarea would form a community there. Ambrose would encourage the building of monasteries and convents and encourage those to pursue the pure moral life. And Augustine himself in Hippo would create a monastery um, alongside the church. These were not centralized. They were generally one house. Um, and though they would seek after to follow whatever rule of life would be presented by their founder. In the West, though, we see two forms of mo uh, monasticism spreading and mixing together to form the, uh, the nature of the monastic communities that will flourish in the medieval church, and to some extent, even towards today. So we're going to look at both of these. One is a Celtic form of monasticism that has specific emphases, and the other is the monasticism of St. Benedict and Benedict's rule. So we're going to look at these in turn, and also see how monasticism moves along with the spread of Christianity itself. So missions and monasticism go very much hand in hand uh, throughout this period. So let's begin by looking at the conversion of Ireland and its um, importance for uh, monastic activity. It's unclear to know when the first Christians came to Ireland, but generally it is tracked back. Um, one of the most significant early missionaries was Patrick. Yes, the man who St. Patrick's Day is named after. Patrick was a Roman Briton, so descendant of those who uh, colonized uh, the uh, Britannic, Britannic islands uh, during the Roman Empire. In his youth, he was captured by Irish pirates and forced to serve as a slave on the island for many years. Eventually, he is able to escape, uh, and as he returns home, he is caught by a vision that tells him to return to Ireland to preach the gospel. And so in 430, 460, Patrick does return to Ireland and preaches the gospel throughout the land. And along the way, he also founds monasteries. So he brings this message of Christianity and embeds it deeply within the Irish context. Um, one of the examples maybe of this kind of unique Celtic form of spirituality that you would be familiar with is the hymn, uh, Be Thou My Vision, which is actually a translation of an ancient Celtic hymn. Um, one of the interesting elements of that, uh, calling 
cry, uh, calling God the high king of heaven is using Irish terminology there, in which there were many lesser kings, and every once in Irish history you'd get a high king, a king of kings. Um, and so they're using this local understanding of political organization to express the supremacy of God over all. Uh, I just find that interesting. So Patrick brings the church to Ireland in some ways. God blesses his mission and it succeeds. He says this in his confession, uh, which is very short and uh, you can find it online. But Patrick says, never before did they know of God except to serve idols and unclean things. But now they have become the people of the Lord and are called children of God. The sons and daughters of the leaders of the Irish are seen to be monks and virgins of Christ. So we see in this that monasticism spreads north very quickly. Uh, and it is seen as part of the spread of Christianity itself, that those are, people are going to move into monasteries and uh, convents. For, there are economic reasons for this. Um, it's hard to provide a dowry for all sons and daughters or a livelihood for them. And so the monasteries are in some ways a social safety net in some ways to give occupations and activities uh, for the many children that were born. But there's also an element of pure piety here of wanting to serve God um, completely. And so there is a unique Celtic form of monasticism, which has its own characteristics. In some ways, the Celtic monastics are quite strict and harsh with very... Uh, laborious acts of fasting, of um, devotion to God, of sometimes even flagellation of whipping oneself or praying all night in the, the freezing sea. And there's a large emphasis on penance here. So for each sin, there are prescribed acts that one must do to uh, show their true penitence and repentance. Uh, for instance, murder was uh, one would have to be on bread and wine, or sorry, bread and water for uh, 10 years. So they developed a very intricate discipline of prescribing what penance are due for what crimes. And so tied with this, we also have the act of pilgrimages for Christ, which were a main part of uh, the Celtic monastic tradition, and what are called peregrini. These would be priests who would go out to spread Christianity and to found new monasteries. One of the most famous of these monks was a man named Columbanus, who would travel back to the continent and spread Christianity amongst the populace of the Frankish Empire um, and found monasteries along the Celtic rule. So this is one form of monasticism that moves into Europe, and it's marked by a very strict and harsh discipline, an emphasis on penance, and this missionary emphasis. This will mix with a missionary movement coming up from the south which, with its own emphases and rules. That is the order founded by St. Benedict of Nursia, who lived in the early, late 5th century, early 6th century. So Benedict was a wealthy young man in Rome. But recall Rome in this time is often seen as very lax and immoral. Seeing all of this, he wants to pursue purely God. Uh, he wants to pursue a purely Christian life. And so he leaves Rome and goes to the countryside, in some ways following after the example of the hermits. However, he becomes renowned for his piety, his knowledge, and his wisdom. And many followers come to learn from him. Out of this, he decides to found a community together. Drawing on a vast knowledge of contemporary monastic literature, such as the um, rules of St. Augustine and some from the East, he writes up his own rule that is trying to be a simplified practice of moral living that would give a programmatic rule of life for the monks as they live together. How can we as a community rightly live unto God together? And so Benedict would write this, the rule of St. Benedict, which would have very important implications throughout the rest of history. Most of the monasteries and monastic orders founded after this period will model their uh, structure over the rule of St. Benedict. So what is the nature of this rule? Monasteries' primary goal was to pursue a communal life seeking God. It was to put aside the cares of um, normal society and seek with all one's heart to pursue God in prayer, fasting, and discipline. And therefore, these monks would take vows, vows of poverty, not to own any personal property, because Benedict saw personal property as causing envy and strife and disagreement. And so all property in the monastery was owned collectively. They would pursue chastity, which is sexual purity in all ways, taking vows of celibacy. And they would take vows of obedience. This can be understood in two ways. One, they're taking a vow of obedience to Christ in everything. And they're taking a vow to obey the abbot of the monastery. In some ways, the monastic communities were seen as 
families in which the abbot presided over as father and the monks as brothers, and they would seek to live a pure life seeking wisdom, prayer, and labor. So we have a structured life of prayer and manual labor and care for others. So each day of a monk's life was structured the same way. Uh, they were living what is called the, the liturgy of the hours. So days would be broken up into different units, some time reserved for communal prayer, others for private prayer, times of rest, times of intentional study and reading, and then times of manual labor to keep up the monastic community um, as a whole. So day would begin before sunrise, in which the monks would all come together for coplines, um, which is the early prayer service in the morning. There would be prayer after dusk as well, and then there would be one at noon, six, at three, um, and then again before dinner, after dinner, and then often one right in the middle of the night. So this would structure the day of every monk. They would be continually offering themselves up to God and going through the scriptures, and also continuing to study and produce theological works, perpetuate and produce. So they'd also spend a lot of time copying out manuscripts from other texts. This form of monasticism with its ordered simplicity uh, would be the, the kind of groundwork of all monastic reforms from here on out. M normally, um, monastic foundations, monastic communities, monastic movements will rise for a while and then after a century or two fall into corruption and laxity. And there will all be always need for reform movements. And these often take the form of a returning to a very, uh, very simple reading of the rule of St. Benedict and trying to live out all the implications that he has set down. So the monastic movements that will characterize Western Europe are a combination in some ways of the Benedictine movements and Celtic spirituality that kind of move together. And the impulses of both of them can be found in medieval piety. One, the order of the day, um, which normally they were uh, praying through the Psalms. And the emphasis on penance would also kind of come to be a part of medieval Catholic uh, Christianity. But I don't want us to neglect the East here. Uh, it's not only in the West that monks thrive, but also in the Eastern Church and the Eastern Church beyond the Roman Empire. So I'm going to focus on some of the missionary work of the monks in the East. So they would, uh, monks who would be part of what we call the Nestorian Church or the Church of the East, recall that we see a split in these churches after the Council of Ephesus, would engage in very daring missionary activity along the Silk Road, founding churches and monasteries in Central Asia, present-day uh, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, uh, Tajikistan, and all the way to China. So we see here from this map the movements of the Nestorian missions to Asia, which take place um, somewhere between the 6th through uh, 9th centuries. And at this time, there are probably more Christians here than anywhere else in the world. Moving from places like Mesopotamia and Baghdad, Nestorians will found churches in the Arabian Peninsula and along the Silk Road in the middle of Europe and all the way to China. And some have even come to Tibet. All of these churches would have been under the authority of the Nestorian Patriarch back in um, the, the Mesopotamia area. One of the most interesting of these is the missionary monk Alopin who was a Syriac-speaking monk who traveled to China during the Tang Dynasty, arriving in 635. Now, Alopin's mission was largely lost to history until the finding of the Nestorian stele, which you can see above me, uh, which was found in the, I believe, 18th century. It records the success of the missionaries in China up to 781, and names Alopin as the first monk who comes. What is interesting about the stele, not only does it show the large presence of a Christian church in China um, as early as the 7th century, but it also shows how these, um, how these figures adapted Christianity to the local way of speaking, using Taoist and Confucian terms to describe and explain who God is. So the influence of the Christianity on early China is quite an interesting feature. Um, if you're interested in this uh, movement to the East, I would recommend to you The Lost History of Christianity by Philip Jenkins, who discusses this, um, or also The History of Christianity, uh, Christianity in Asia by a man named Moffat. However, the Christian church, although it flourished for many years, because it was tied very much to the, um, the largesse of the emperor, 
uh, ended up being wiped out in the persecutions in the ninth century as the Tang Emperor turned his eye against all religions that were not Confucianism. So along with Buddhism, uh, Christianity would be wiped out of China for several centuries. With all that being said, let's talk about the contributions of monasticism to the church. We can begin with their emphasis on piety and prayer. The monks really were, in some ways, the conscience of the society and, and were examples to many lay people and others alike. They devoted their lives purely to God and they offered up many prayers um, daily for the salvation of souls, for the good of missions, for the charity and mercy of God. So we can respect them for that and there is much to be gained by understanding and reading some of the monastic works of piety. Um, these were serious people seeking after God and we can learn from them. One of the most significant contributions is the preservation and the continuation of scholarship and learning into the Middle Ages. Recall that after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, things are rather chaotic, and scholarship is going to be very hard to maintain in its normal centers of schools and towns because many of them are destroyed. The monks, because of their need to uh, grow deeper in their knowledge of God, would copy out texts from the ancient world. Almost every manuscript we have of the Bible, every manuscript we have of um, the fathers, come from monastic libraries as they very meticulously copy these works generation after generation and begin to uh, make works of their own. Many of the most important, if not all of the most important scholars in the Middle Ages will come from the monastic context. And it's out of the monastery schools that we'll see the rise of universities. So this is a large contribution of the monastic, monastic communities to Christianity. Additionally, they would serve the society in acts of mercy and charity. It was at the monasteries where the poor, the widow, and the orphan could find rest, could find uh, food. And so they were, in some ways, functioning as the social safety net of the medieval world, in which it's here that the poor and the destitute could come for succor. And so the, the monks were a, very active in their life. They weren't just locked up alone. Some, some monasteries were. But many would spend active time giving to the poor and caring for the poor. And in all these ways, the monastic communities provide stability during a disordered society especially after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. It is the institutions of the church and primarily the monasteries that continue on the spreading of Christianity and the uh, giving people peace and some sort of hope in what was several very tumultuous centuries. And so the monastic communities become extremely important throughout this period. We've also seen that monks contributed greatly to the spread of Christianity and missions. In some ways, every missionary of the medieval and early medieval period were monks themselves. They were dedicated to their goal, and as they would uh, go to a place and preach the gospel, they would also found new missionaries. We have the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons to thank for a monk named uh, St. Augustine of Canterbury. We already saw Patrick's work in Ireland. We mentioned Boniface's work amongst the Saxons. We should also mention the work of two monks named Cyril and Methodius, who were Eastern monks who went north from Constantinople to preach the gospel to the Slavic tribes, especially the Rus, who will become Russia. And so this movement out uh, of the monasteries to found new ones to preach the gospel is a major contribution of this and will continue throughout the medieval and even into the early modern period with most uh, Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic missionaries after the Reformation time also being monks or religious orders. But we also need to have some evaluation and critique of monasticism because it was not, um, while we definitely need to appreciate all the things they did for the church, there are also tendencies that need to be um, carefully guarded against. For one is they have a very Neoplatonic anthropology. And what do I mean by this? Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, Neoplatonic thought before, but there's the separation of body and soul, and the body ends up being the source of sin. So an emphasis on the discipline of the body, the ascetic practices of extreme fasting, um, sleeping on uh, just wooden planks, very austere life and food they thought was necessary to move forward to God. And we don't want to dismiss these practices too quickly. Um, scripture clearly talks about disciplining the body as an important element of Christian piety. That is why uh, we have fast. This is why we seek simplicity. And know that uh, worldly gain and 
uh, material things can lead us away from God. However, their emphasis so much on the body and its denigration, this extreme form of asceticism, uh, would often go too far and lead one to almost a semi-Pelagian type movement. We are already noted that John Cassian was one of those who rejected and uh, worked against Augustine's understanding of uh, salvation. And John Cassian was probably one of the most influential uh, figures to spread monasticism in Western Europe before Benedict's rule. And so because of this focus on disciplining the body, on moral life and moral striving and prayer, many monastics would take on a semi-Pelagian experience. And this would lead uh, partially to their withdrawal from society, to remove themselves from the influence of the world itself. And I think we also need to critique this. While many monastic communities would be active in the society, giving uh, aid to the poor, um, many, many others would not, being very self-contained um, and leading to this separation, this idea of the separate spaces for the sacred and the secular which leads in some ways to an idea of a two-tiered Christianity, in which you have the monks who are to be truly religious. They need to follow Christ's teachings fully. And by their prayers, they then make up for the lower tier of Christianity, who are the lay people, who are not necessarily supposed to take it as seriously and can be given more leeway in moral behavior. This does not seem to be in any way found in the New Testament, with all people needing to seek after pure commitment to Christ. And so this would set up a kind of double standard within the Christian church in which the laity are slowly devalued and they are not religious, right? So this word religious versus lay comes in here and they are not as close to God. They are not pursuing sacred tasks and they are in some ways lesser in the kingdom of God than the monks, the priests, and the religious. Uh, They're pursuing a lesser path. This can be seen, for instance, in the a preference of singleness and celibacy over marriage, as seeing marriage as a lesser state and the pursuit of virginity and celibacy as higher than the pursuit of marriage, which would lead to uh, various implications. Uh, all these ideas will be pushed back against during the Reformation, and we'll talk about these more later. Now I want us to turn to the other major and epical event of this era, uh, that changes much of the, the Roman Empire and its former areas and has deep implications for the church. And this is the rise of Islam in the 6th and 7th centuries, and it's spread throughout North Africa and the Middle East. This will be a massive event for the church and will uh, put much of the church under Muslim rule and shift the emphasis of the church much more away from the Mediterranean, which has now become not a kind of stable Christian sea, but is a fraught endeavor. So let us turn briefly to the rise of Islam. I'm going to talk briefly about the life of Muhammad. I'm not going to get into uh, Islamic theology or much more into that today, um, but we just need this as a context to understand the history of the church. So I'm going to briefly discuss the life of Muhammad and the rise of Islam and its effects on the medieval uh, church. So we need to understand in some ways the world that uh, Muhammad is born into. He's born in Mecca, which you can see there on the map, and uh, he is quickly orphaned at a young age and raised by his uncle Abu Talib. His uncle was a merchant, and Muhammad worked with him around the Arabian Peninsula and likely beyond. At this time, there are uh, the Arabian Peninsula is not much interest to anyone uh, because of the large desert in the center. And so the B Byzantine Empire and the Persian or Iranian Empire at the times largely ignore it. However, these two empires, Byzantium, uh, which is the name for the eastern half of the Roman Empire after the fall of the West, and the Saracen Empires are continually fighting each other. Um, year after year, they fight wars. Sometimes Rome will come out on top, sometimes the Persians will come out on top, but in this, they had, both of their uh, resources had become depleted, and they were both weak uh, from kind of uh, the decadence of their courts. So uh, Constantinople would raise very heavy taxes throughout the empire to furnish very lavish building projects and luxury within the court. So as Muhammad is born, the two major powers to the north are in a very weakened state. So for the first 40 years of Muhammad's life, they're fairly uneventful. He is a merchant and a trader. It is in 610 that we see the event that Muslims attribute for the beginning of Islam, and that is called the Night of Power. 
in which Muhammad praying in a cave outside of Mecca receives a message through the angel Gabriel, uh, which he is told to recite and become a prophet of Allah. Uh, this is the found foundational movement that uh, Muslims find the, the foundation of Islam in. Uh, after several years where he doesn't really discuss this with anyone other than his family, he begins to preach monotheism around Mecca. Now this was very significant because Mecca was a center of uh, idol worship in the area. The center of town was the Kaaba, uh, the black stone cube that you'll actually see on um, in Mecca today that Muslims will circ circumambulate. Um, and by preaching monotheism, Muhammad is bad for business. And some of the most uh, important tribes in the city are opposed to him because he's trying to move people away from worshiping these idols. Eventually, Muhammad is kicked out of the city with his few followers in 622, which is the beginning of the Islamic calendar, and he goes to Medina, um, or at the time it was known as Yathrib. Over many years, he continues to preach in Medina, and there are many battles uh, both in Medina and with the Meccan people. And 630, he returns to Mecca, and they accept Islam. Okay, so this is, we could go into much more depth about the nature of Muhammad's life and his influence. But it is from this that the Muslim uh, nation spreads. And this is partially because Muhammad begins to, in order to uh, successfully take Mecca, he makes alliances with many of the Bedouin tribes and forms them into an um, a alliance together. After Muhammad's death, though, Islam would spread extremely rapidly as the Arab armies would conquer more and more territory, taking advantage of the weakness of both Byzantium and uh, the Persian Empire. So we see on the map here that within roughly 30 years of Muhammad's death, the Muslim forces have taken over much of what we would now see as the Middle East and Egypt. Uh, some important dates here are in 367, Jerusalem falls to the Arab invaders, and later in the, the new, the Umayyad Caliphate, um, Muslim forces will cross the Straits of Gibraltar and spread into Spain in 711. Um, their furthest extent of um, movement within the part of Western Europe comes at the Battle of Tours in 732, uh, which is often seen as a um, kind of symbolic moment. Older discussions have seen this as a failed invasion attempt. Uh, modern scholars think this is not the case. Uh, what was going on at Tours was a kind of reconnaissance party to feel out the strength of the French, uh, the Franks, and this was actually defeated, and they stopped advancing at the Pyrenees later. Significant for this is the victor of this battle was a man named Charles Martel, um, who we'll see come up later as the grandfather of Charlemagne. So, as this Muslim forces spread across the world, this is going to have vast implications for Christianity. The heartland of Christianity in Mesopotamia, in the Levant, in Egypt, those places where scholarship would have occurred are now under Muslim rule. And the Western Roman, the Western part of the empire uh, has lost Spain with the failing of the Visigothic and the Vandal kingdoms. And the East is under continual assault by uh, Muslim, Muslim forces. And this is going to vastly change the understanding of Europe and the world until this very day. So let's talk about a couple of the impacts of Islam. Uh, we can talk more about this in discussion time if you'd like, but uh, we need to just get some basic things on the table here. So the first main thing is the Christians of the Middle East and North Africa came fully under Muslim rule. They were left in the status of second-class citizens. All, because they were people of the book, they were not forced to convert in this early period, um, but were forced to pay a tax to continue following their beliefs. This change in rule, though, was welcomed by some, because as I'd said, the Byzantine Empire um, levied very heavy and uh, rough taxes on its provinces, and had been actively pers persecuting non-Chalcedonian Christians for many years. So some saw, saw the change from the Byzantine rule to the Muslim rule as even a good thing and a judgment on God upon Byzantium. In some places, Christianity continued to fl flourish even under Islam. Specifically, Egypt and the Middle East continued to flourish for many years. Uh, Christians were often given high places in the court of the caliph, um, and were generally left alone in these areas um, with 
theology is still flourishing and community is still flourishing. Uh, for instance, Egypt till this day still has a large proportion of Coptic Christians, roughly 10%. Uh, at various other times, it was much higher. Um, and even theology would flourish in some of these areas with one of the most significant and influential theologians of the Eastern Church, John of Damascus, serving initially as a secretary within the Caliph's court. However, this would be different in other places such as North Africa, which quickly assimilated to the new religion. Um, and scholars debate why this is, why did Christianity remain strong in the Middle East and Egypt while it seemed to quickly disappear in North Africa? Some scholars think that the difference was that in North Africa, Christianity was still very much only an urban religion. And the pastors and priests and missions had not made much headway into the countryside. And so with the coming of the Muslim armies, the towns were sacked and many of these Christians fled to other places. And those who remained were not very dedicated to the faith and had only kind of put a Christian veneer on their previous beliefs. And so switching to Islam was not much of a jump for them. So we see that there are various... Um, reactions of the church to the rise of Islam throughout these areas. A couple other more broad things is that the rise of Islam fundamentally changed the economic and political realities of the Mediterranean region. This region, which for centuries had been a kind of highway uh, of trade for first the Romans and then the Christian kingdoms throughout it, is now fundamentally changed. It is no longer uh, simply safe. There are many uh, dangers of piracy of continued invasion, and many trade routes are now cut off, especially the lucrative trade route between Constantinople through the Silk Road. This is taken over by Muslim powers. And so this leads to many effects. Um, the downgrading of economic status causes many problems, and trade and communication between East and West begin to break down because uh, sea travel is not nearly as easy. So this continues to exasperate these tensions between the East and the West that we saw already with the fall of the Western Roman Empire. With the changing import of the Mediterranean Sea, which is no longer the kind of lifeblood of Europe that it once was, much focus and power of especially the church focuses to the north, especially with the rise of the kingdom of the Franks. So this shifts the kind of focus of religious history from the south to the north, and we'll be looking at that in time. Part of this is that places that were once considered insignificant, maybe the fringe of civilization, such as uh, England, now take on greater prominence and importance within the history of Europe, as they are necessary to help offset the power of Islamic forces in the South. Islam will also force uh, give much in terms of uh, foils for intellectual and theological discussion, as the church must respond to the attacks and polemics against them. And there's also a movement from uh, later in the uh, Middle Ages, which we'll talk about next time, a preservation of certain ancient philosophical texts through the Muslim courts, which will be very influential on medieval Catholic theology. So with this, I want to then move into some of the developments that will set the stage for the high Middle Ages, some of those things that will help us understand the changing shape of Christianity from roughly seven or 800 uh, to the mid-10th century. And for this, we're going to look at two major themes, the rise of the papacy and the rise of the understanding of Christendom. So to begin, let's, be, let's think about a very symbolic event. In 800, Charlemagne, the king of the Franks, who has spent his entire life conquering and expanding the kingdom, is crowned Holy Roman Empire, Emperor by Innocent III, the current pope. This event symbolizes, in some ways, the union and relationship between church and state that will determine much of the next 700 years of Christian history in Europe, with the secular authority being blessed by the church and promising to protect it and serve it in some ways, and the church putting itself under the protection of the secular rule. This combination of the pope uh, crowning an emperor is very symbolic for the, the rise of the papacy as important as it is. So I want to take a look at how does the papacy develop and what are the natures of Christendom, this union of church and state with secular and sacred realms of authority that will um, determine much of Christianity and Christian Europe until um, roughly the Reformation and even beyond. So let's begin with the papacy. Uh, 
We've already seen from the 3rd to 4th centuries that the Bishop of Rome would periodically claim superiority over all the other patriarchs. Recall, in the early church, there were five patriarchs that were often seen as equals. Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria. But the Bishop of Rome would every once in a while try to play the card that he is supreme. And to support this, he would look at places like Matthew 16, in which Christ talks about Peter as the rock on whom he will build his church. Because the Bishop of Rome claims to have... Um, Arisen from the bishopric of Peter, he claimed that he was supreme authority in the church. This was rarely listened to by any of the other patriarchs who um, challenged this authority. Even many bishops within the West, which would have been normally under the kind of immediate supervision of the patriarch of the area, area would push back against this. Especially Carth Carthaginian bishops would rarely listen when the Pope tried to change the um, outcome of a council, for instance, going all the way back to Cyprian. However, with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, um, this dynamic changes. In some ways, the papacy is one of the leading and remaining major institutions within there, as we've seen along with the monasteries. And so the power of the papacy increases greatly. Nobody is really looking out for the city of Rome anymore except for the popes themselves. We talked a little bit about this. Uh, a good example is when Leo the Great uh, negotiates with Attila the Hun stopping him from sacking the city of Rome. And so the prominence of the Pope and the papacy in the Western Empire goes higher and higher as the Roman rule kind of goes away. One of the most significant figures in the rise of papal authority and prestige during the early medieval period is a man named Gregory the Great. And Gregory is elected Pope. He is initially a monk in 590. And his work will be extremely uh, foundational for the development of the papacy. He helped stabilize the war-torn Italy, which is in this time once again reft with battles between various tribes. He also was a scholar of some renown, writing a biography of St. Benedict and a pastoral rule for the training of clergy. He was very much a man with deep pastoral skills and deep organizational skills. He brought about liturgical and monastic reforms throughout Europe, and he set up a system of dioceses and bishoprics to control and to um, have order throughout the time. And it is from him that we get this understanding uh, that the Pope is to be the servus servorum dei, the servant of the servants of God. This was the highest kind of goal of the papacy in, in Gregory's time, and he really did succeed where others uh, would fail both before him and after him. He was a rather remarkable man. His name, Gregory the Great, interestingly enough, is not because of anything he did in um, theology or in even organizing the church, but in his care for the poor. He was actually given the title Gregory the Great by the poor of Rome, who he was very assiduous to care for, to provide food for, and to look out for. Through, so through very um, capable popes like Gregory, the scope, the reach, and the prestige of the Bishop of Rome would spread throughout the Western Empire because there, there's nothing else at this time with the falling of Roman rule. And so in some ways, some of the rule of the Roman authority will pass through the Pope as the Bishop of Rome. We need to combine with this the rise of Christendom, in which the papacy is allied with royal power to bring about the Christianization of Europe in every way. The man who most exemplifies this is Charlemagne, also known as Charles the Great, who was the Frankish king and one of the leaders of the Carolingian dynasty, which replaced the older dynasty of the Merovingians uh, founded by Clovis. Charlemagne was the grandson of Charles Martel, who we talked about before, who defeated the Muslim armies at the Battle of Tours. His father was Pepin the Short, who began to engage in this intentional alliance with the, with the Bishop of Rome. Uh, it is actually Pippin who gives what is called the Donation of Pippin, establishing the Papal States, or giving uh, the Pope authority and military uh, oversight of the kind of middle part of the Italian peninsula which the Pope will maintain until the 1870s. Okay. So Charlemagne would be a great king from the kind of old Frankish style. He was very mighty in battle, he was uh, generous, he was powerful, and he would spread his empire very quickly to become the largest and most powerful empire by far in the West, and in some ways rivaling the Eastern Roman Empire and certain Muslim powers at the same time. Uh, just to get a sense of the spread of his kingdom, which would cover pretty much what we think of present-day France and Germany, 
Um, we see here in this map, he's actually taking the territory that was originally uh, conquered by Clovis and a little bit of the fathers and grandfathers of Charlemagne and extending it all the way to the Danube River, covering everything that we would understand as uh, present-day Germany. And he does this through continual warfare against the Saxons, who were a pagan people. And he doesn't always do this in the right way. Uh, while I think that Charlemagne was a very pious and intentional king, uh, he does not always live up to the Christian standards of rulership we would like. Um, at one point, he does offer a large number of Saxons the choice of death or baptism, and they choose baptism. And so we should not overlook these failings and see that um, he was very much a man of his time, and he was prone to sin and failure as much as anyone else. But this power would bring stability to Western Europe for the first time, and it would secure the position of the papacy as uh, advising and even in some ways presiding over the kings of Europe, especially on religious and moral matters. So in Christendom, there is kind of a division of labor between the secular authority of the king and the sacred authority of the church represented by the pope. In issues of morality and in issues of piety, the church is able to override the princes. Now, this is going to be a tense uh, arrangement, right? What if the king thinks the pope is wrong on this case? And we'll look at some of this later. And the secular authority will leave the church alone and protect it and promote Christianity in the civil sphere as much as they can. So there is a division of sacred and secular leadership here, but they are unified together under a commitment to Christ, as all kings will be um, trying to be worthy participants and children of the church. It is the empire of Charlemagne that cements this connection between church and state that would persist throughout Europe for the next thousand years. And he did much for the church. He oversaw much reform. He invited scholars to his courts who would write many important texts and continue to perpetuate um, the, the manuscript traditions. In fact, most uh, manuscripts we have today come from this uh, Carolingian period. He would also go to great lengths to improve clerical education, founding schools, uh, demanding a certain level of education for priests so they could actually say Mass correctly and care for the people, and he would also commission vernacular Bibles and liturgies. So in some sense, Charlemagne is seen as the ideal medieval Christian ruler. He is pious. He seeks very firmly after God. Um, I believe this is the case. He Charlemagne was always considered with the judgment of God coming upon him and realized that the rule and care of the morality of his kingdom um, would be placed upon his shoulders. And so he did truly try to seek God as best he could, although we could definitely point out places where he failed to do so as well as we might hope. He offered protection to the church's interests, securing their uh, rights to property and their perpetuation. He would enforce morality amongst his servants and try to keep the rule of law and care for the poor. And this was done by protecting the faithful both internally from those who would seek to harm the poor, the widow, the orphan, the destitute, and from outside by uh, holding the line against the invaders uh, of both the pagan Saxons and the Muslim forces in Spain. So in Charlemagne should be seen uh, a great figure in history in some ways who did much to preserve the church and his kingdom would definitively shape Europe from then on. Um, in fact, this practice of being crowned by the Pope in some ways will be the, the standard for the Holy Roman Empire throughout the rest of the time. Charlemagne did not see himself in the early Middle Ages, but as a continuation of the Roman Empire, which in some ways he saw himself as a new Constantine, or even a new David, who was called to protect the Church of God and promote faithfulness. So, having set up some of these elements of papacy and Christendom, I want us to prepare us for next week and some of the ideas we're going to be carrying on into the Middle Ages proper. We've noticed in this lecture that there was continuing tensions between the East and the West, first by the fall of the Western Roman Empire, and then by the rise of Islam that made communications and economic ties much weaker. And because of this, there will be continued estrangement between the Church of Constantinople and the Church in the West. Next time, we'll see this come to a head in what is known as the Great Schism. Also, this relationship between papacy and crown was not always very um, mutual. There were times where there was deep tensions between them. Who is really in control here? Is the pope above the king? Is the king above the pope? How does this all work out? We'll see these tensions continue throughout the Middle Ages.
There will also be continual conf uh, confrontations with Islam, both intellectually and militarily, and we'll see how this works out slightly as we move further on. Another factor I want to point out that's very important to realize, especially with monastic communities, is that throughout history there's continual cycles of corruption and reform. Every institution seems to be founded, and after several centuries of faithfulness degenerating into some measure of corruption that needs to be reformed again. And we'll see this tension throughout the Middle Ages. Uh, these monastic orders that were founded would eventually become lax, they would fail to fulfill their duties properly, and they would need to be reformed either from within or new foundations founded without. And the reform would then, after several centuries, often move into corruption and need to be reformed again. And these, um, these are dynamics that persist to the present day. But we're going to see them as a very important movement uh, within the Middle Ages that perpetuate more reform and um, development within the church. So next time, we'll be moving into the Middle Ages proper, looking at the Great Schism, the break between the East and the West in 1054, and looking at some of the very important issues in the medieval Western Church, especially the rise of universities, of cathedrals, and of certain monastic orders, and the continued uh, rise of the papacy and the implications of this for the Reformation. So I look forward to talking to you next time, and have a good day.